to order. First on our agenda today, we have Senate File 3721, which is a bill that Senator Mann brings before us. Um, um, and I understand, Senator Mann, that you have an A1 amendment. I do, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Um, can, uh, would a member move the A1 amendment for Senator Mann? Thank you, Senator Kupek uh, moves that uh, the adoption of the A1 author's amendment. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The A1 uh, amendment is adopted. Senator Mann, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Member Senate File 3721 closes a loophole in restrictive employment agreements that was brought to our attention this summer. Last session, we did really great work uh, to make sure that people in Minnesota have the right to work where they want and to work for who they want by eliminating the use of some restrictive employment restrictions like non-competes and no-poach agreements. These restrictive employment restrictions have been shown to depress workers' wages, limit career growth by creating barriers for people to uh, build experience within a given industry. They also hamper innovation and they block entrepreneurs from starting new businesses. Unfortunately, after these laws went into effect, um, it came to light that there was additional anti-competitive restrictive employment covenants that very unfairly restrict the ability of workers to find and keep jobs in their region and in their industries. To be clear, they prevent people from working where they want and when they want. The worst part is that these specific restrictions are in service contracts between two entities without the knowledge or consent of the employee that it impacts. So we call these shadow non-competes, and they operate, again, above the head of the workers that they impact, meaning that they will limit a worker's job opportunities without their knowledge. So this summer, when workers came forward and exposed these provisions and service contracts, it became clear that further legislation was needed to close these loopholes, whereby companies can continue to restrict workers uh, through what are essentially hidden non-competes. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, I have some testifiers who can further explain what has happened. Thank you very much, Senator Mann. Uh, first on our list of testifiers, we have Lev Roth. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. If you would please introduce yourself for the record, and we look forward to hearing your testimony. Thank you. Um, my name is Lev Roth, and I work for First Service Residential at a desk attendant at a high-rise condo. Um, I handle resident requests, monitor building access, and let in emergency services. Last year, we successfully fought to get rid of non-compete clauses in the contracts, only to find out that First Service Residential has covenants in their contracts with homeowners associations that restrict hiring any First Service employ residential employee. Madam Chair. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit louder, oh. please? A little closer, Mike. Thank you. Closer. Yeah, our apologies. I think that we have some talking going on too, and then it, it, that's okay. People are trying to figure out some things. But if you oh. just put the micro or the microphone just a little bit closer to your mouth, perhaps that would be helpful. Thank right. you very is, much. Is this better? Yeah. Sorry right. for the interruption. Thank you. Um, all right. So last year we successfully fought to get rid of non-compete clauses in our contracts only to find out that First Service Residential has covenants in their contracts with homeowners associations that restrict hiring any First Service Residential employee, either directly or indirectly, after the First Service contract with the homeowners association ends. We employees have no say about the terms of these covenants, even though they directly affect our employment and our chances of advancement in the industry. In fact, we weren't even aware of these unfair restrictions until the member of the press told us last year. These restrictive covenants mean that when building switch management companies, they can't keep their experienced staff. In other words, loyal and hardworking staff would lose their jobs simply because first service has been replaced by the management company. It also means any building that has switched companies in the past two years has to throw out resumes that list first service residential on it. I didn't even bother applying to a a job that I knew would mean a 25% wage increase in union benefits because it was at a high rise that had just ended its contract with First Service Residential and that the high rise could face a lawsuit if I were to be hired. Working in the same industry should give workers an advantage in the hiring process, not make companies threaten their previous clients with lawsuits. These restrictive covenants are bad for workers, bad for anyone who signs a contract with one, and bad for the property services industry. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, next on our list of te testifiers, we have Brian Shea. Good 
Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If you'd please introduce yourself for the record, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing your testimony. Uh, my name is Brian Shea. I worked six years for First Service Residential in Minnesota, most of those years as the overnight desk attendant, Gallery Tower here in St. Paul. In April 2023, coworkers and I learned about First Service Residential's restrictive covenants from an article in the American Prospect, not from our employer. 48 workers petitioned First Service to disclose how many of us were subject to these shadow non-competes. There was a difficulty in explaining this to other workers, which is that what we're describing made no sense to them. It made no sense to our coworkers that there would be a restriction on their employment that they had never heard of and that they had never agreed to. Now, last summer, these restrictive covenants became a crisis for workers at River Towers. When residents chose not to renew their contract with First Service, they were going to lose that experienced staff because First Service said they would enforce the restrictive covenant. About half the staff was on track to be laid off, right? Not transferred, laid off, because there were not enough transfer opportunities to other properties. Well, residents wanted to retain that experienced staff, right? If they're not going somewhere else, why not offer to let them stay where they know the building, they know the residents, and in some cases, they've been there over a decade. Right. But First Service said they would enforce the restrictive covenant to prevent River Towers residents from retaining staff that they know and that they trust. So to fight for their jobs, workers went to local media, continued trying to discuss the problem created by shadow non-competes with management. All right. In the light of this pressure campaign, First Service agreed to at least allow staff who did not receive transfers to remain at River Towers like residents had wanted. But workers shouldn't have to mount a public pressure campaign every time an employer tries to enforce a restricted covenant. All right, how many workers are in a position to do that? All right. Waging a public fight was only an option for us because we were also in the middle of a unionization effort. All right. Now this past December, the overnight at Gallery Tower was eliminated and I was laid off. Now looking for work, I have no way of knowing where these covenants restrict my employment. And even if I did know, the existence of the covenants still limits employment opportunities and it distorts the labor market. All right. Last year, Minnesota got rid of non-competes and these, re these remaining shadow non-competes cause a similar harm. Let's finish the job. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next on our list, we have Wade Lundberg. Good afternoon, welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. If you'd please introduce yourself for the record and we look forward to your testimony. Chair McCune, thank you. Senators, Wade Lunaberg. Uh, I am a 35 year resident of Minneapolis and a 10 year resident of uh, the River Towers at First and Hennepin in downtown Minneapolis. Uh, I believe it's one of the largest complexes in the Twin Cities with 350 units and 550 or so residents. Uh, uh, and from 1965, it's a large building to manage and to take care of. <clears throat> While I'm not a member of the HOA board, I'm a very active participant in our community. Um, and, uh, and again, because of the size and the age of our building, uh, we have anywhere from 16 to 20 workers in the building um, uh, with many different skill sets, um, office staff, door and garage attendants, security, outdoor staff, engineers uh, that really keep our, our community um, pulled together. Um, First Service Residential, which was formerly Gittleman, uh, was a decades-long management company um, at our, at our um, property. Um, 
we were experiencing a number of issues with first service. Um, they were paying themselves as a project manager for large renovation projects that included a, bun uh, a bungled uh, HVAC renovation that we actually had to do twice at the cost of $3 million each time that led to litigation, arbitration, subrogation, um, all to come to a resolution. They also um, ran a very badly managed um, hallway renovation um, where um, essentially we were in, again in a position of suing contractors through first service. Um, and um, finally, um, a $3 million parking ramp um, renovation that also just uh, was really a troubling project for, for the HOA. Uh, in late 2022, uh, the HOA decided to uh, put out an RFP for a new management company. And um, I will say at nearly the same time, workers in our buildings uh, demonstrated their interest in joining a union, which many residents were fully supportive of. And uh, it was fair to say that First Service was not pleased um, with what the workers were trying to gain. Uh, ultimately, the RFP went to a different management company. Uh, and in the transition, uh, First Service informed us that they would transfer a number of the workers to other properties, but the majority of the workers were going to be laid off or fired. Um, they were also, we were also informed uh, that we wouldn't have the ability to hire the workers, and that is the first time we'd, we'd understood that we had a restrictive covenant in our contract, which was decades old. Um, Largely out of spite and with the loss of their contract, First Service you know, literally leveraged the HOA against the workers uh, that we wanted to keep. And uh, ultimately, a number of waivers were offered, uh, but there's no doubt that, that workers walked away from the property um, or retired long before they needed to. And quite honestly, as a 10-year resident and speaking, and speaking probably for residents that have been there for upwards of 50 years, um, uh, we miss those workers and uh, they deserved better. Um, please do the right thing um, for well-intended groups like mine um, in trying to support and keep their workforce. I appreciate it. Thank you for your testimony. Um, that concludes all of the testifiers that we had to sign up uh, to submit testimony today. Is there anybody else who has joined us who wishes to testify? Okay. Well, not seeing any, any um, more testifiers who intend to offer any testimony, I'm going to move to discussion and questions from our members. Um, yes, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, first, uh, I want to start. There's a lot of things I want to talk about, but first, I want to move the A2 amendment. Uh, thank you, Senator Liskey. Um, I don't think we have it in our package. Okay. So I'll have to hand it out. Is, uh, is it, do we have copies? Yep. Okay. We're going to have the A2 amendment passed out. Um, Senator Liskey, would you like to go ahead and tell us about your amendment while it's being passed out? Sure. So. First of all, Senator Mann, thank you for the A1 amendment. As I'm sure you knew, I was probably going to offer something to adjust the post or previous contract issues, so I appreciate that. Uh, the A2 amendment strictly is moving the July 1st date to August 1st, and the reason is that generally in the Senate we, we focus on policy bills starting in August and more like financial bills starting in July. So I don't know how you feel about it, but generally this is what the, the Senate does. It gives it a little more time to adjust to policy changes um, and for that reason, that's why I'm offering this amendment. Okay. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Um, I want to make sure I think that um, the amendment is fairly simple. Um, Senator Mann, would you like to respond um, before we go to um, any member questions or discussion about the A2 amendment? Sure, Madam Chair. Um, without the author's amendment, I could see why that would be necessary because there was some signage necessary. I don't think this is terribly necessary at this point, but I also don't have a problem with it. So either way, I'm fine with it, Madam Chair. OK. Um, members, any questions or further discussion on? Yes, Senator Marty. Madam Chair, I, I think. Um, I share the author's thought it's not a big deal for one month, but I also don't know 
I mean, the point for having August 1st is especially for things like something becomes against the law or something, but the effective date here doesn't, the main thing it does is say that a contract it's entered into or after that date. In other words, if if some business would enter into a contract like this after uh, August 10th, not being aware of the law, the only consequence is that the the law that they're not exempt from the law. So I don't know that. I mean, the only reason you'd want to do it earlier is because people might I'll sign a contract quickly before this takes effect. I don't know. That's a big deal. I just don't know. It's a big. If the author has no problem with it, I don't either, but I, I don't think it's as essential here because if somebody makes a mistake and they weren't aware of the law, which is why we give till August 1st, I mean, if it was July 10th or something and I entered into a contract like this, the only consequence would be that that, that provision of the contract would be void. Yeah. Senator Liskey. Madam Chair and Senator Marty, to kind of answer that, um, there is some language in here that does require employers to notify employees that do have contracts that would that would already fall under this as becoming not a, not a legal agreement. So it still does require notification to employees. So there is some some timeline stuff that might have impact on this. So. Okay. Um, any further discussion or questions about the A2 amendment? Okay. Um, all in favor of adopting the A2 amendment onto Senate file uh, 3721, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the A2 amendment is adopted. Further discussion, Senator Liskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Mann, uh, I think the number one thing that I had uh, relating to this bill that I had some, some interested parties that came to my office to talk to me about it um, was related to child care. Um, and I, we just heard in HHS, you, you sat on the committee with me and we listened to child care and the discussions on the struggles that we're dealing with uh, facing child care. Uh, their number one concern is that at times we're going to have parents that are going to need, let's just say, for, for example, I have two children. Uh, it costs about $175 a month per child to go to child care. Well, I can hire a teacher at $250 and have them become my nanny and it's going to be equivalent to their hourly wage or even maybe better than their hourly wage at these facilities. And now that's taking away a provider from that child care center, which is already struggling to hire enough providers as it is. Um, so that's one of the only problems that I see with, with this bill. Otherwise, I do greatly understand why the individuals are here. And I fully support the idea of wanting to be able to hire people that, that are skilled at what they do. So I'm not opposed to the bill. I'm just worried about the child care effect that there's going to be on this, so. Thank you, Senator Liskey. Um, Senator Mann, do you have any response or anything you'd like to say before we have any, entertain any further discussion or questions? Sure, Madam Chair. Um, good concern. Um, but the issue is, is that right now, child care providers are not leaving to become nannies, right? Because it's very rare that a family can afford the current salary of that child care provider that everyone pays for in a group. They're leaving to go work at anywhere else. Box office store, big box stores, um, the subway down the street, because they get paid more. And we're not gonna fix our childcare crisis by forcing people to do a job that they don't want to do. We're gonna fix it other ways, right? Um, and so I, I personally would never want the person taking care of my children to be someone who doesn't wanna be there. <laughs> um, and so for those reasons, while I understand what you're saying, this would be the very wrong way to go about solving that problem. Thank you, Senator Mann. Thank you, Senator Liskey, for the discussion. Um, senators and members, any further discussion or questions? Yes, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you to the testifiers for coming in. I know it's, uh, we always appreciate you coming in, so thank you for testifying. I just have a couple questions. I heard first service uh, two or three times, so just wondering the broadness of this um, problem. Other businesses, other, uh, we heard about childcare. What other ones are there that are affected uh, by this? Um, workers and businesses that partner with the, uh, with their, uh, what is it? But oh, that's good enough there. I'll get to the next one next. 
Senator Mann. Madam Chair, Senator. So we first heard about this problem through them, right? Uh, the issue is we, we don't know whose contracts these are in because they are secret. Mm -hmm. They occur between two entities that don't involve the actual employee and the employee, the employee, yeah, the employee. And the employee does not even know that that exists, that that is something that will obstruct them from getting jobs in the future. Um, so we don't know the extent of this problem. We don't know how prevalent these things actually are because of that. Senator Jornick, yeah. So uh, I, the child care, I saw, I watched the House um, hearing, and so he spoke, and, and he said that they did for his contracts, he did. So I'm just wondering, did you get any other feedback from others, uh, businesses, or to oppose this and some of the dialogue? Did you have some uh, dialogue with others, or was it just them? Senator Mann. Madam Chair, the uh, Senator, the only people that came forward to have, to have concerns about it were the child care providers. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so HOAs, is that the biggest source of the problem of this non-compete, or is it many other sources or other businesses? Senator Mann. At this moment, I would say the biggest issue is the HOAs and those contracts. But again, because these things are done in secret, we have no idea who else they will impact. Follow up, Senator Dornick. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So you're saying that, so when the worker signs a contract, they're signing something and it, it's not in there. There's no, it, nothing in there to, um, I mean, it seems odd to me, but. Yeah, there's, it's not there anywhere. Senator Mann. Madam Chair, so the, the, employee, the employee is not signing a contract that has any of this in, their, in that language. The contract is being signed by their employer and the people that they are having a contract with. Senator Dornick. Madam Chair, thank you. So first service, like I said, it sounds like that they uh, definitely have a, you know, with the workers, I don't know why you would not want the workers back that know the building. I don't, I'm confused on that one, but. That's a very good question. Yeah, that is a good question. Senator Mann, do you have any comment about that issue? No. Yeah. Any follow-up? Okay. Good questions. Anybody else, uh, any other members have any discussion or questions that they'd like to um, raise? Yes, Senator Kubik. I'll just raise one uh, more just a comment, Madam Chair, um, because I, these are obviously shadow contracts. And last year, obviously, we did work to, to eliminate those non-compete ones. And it's something that, uh, as somebody who has worked under a non-compete contract, um, that I'm not a fan of. So thank you for bringing this to the attention and, and this bill forward. So thanks. Thank you, Senator Kubek. Um, and, and I also, um, Senator Mann, thank you very much for bringing this bill forward and thank you very much to the advocates and the testifiers and the people who have been negatively affected by these types of uh, covenants that were made over their heads and um, bringing this issue. This is exactly the type of thing that we can address here at the legislature to prevent these things from happening to other people going forward. So when you do this kind of advocacy, it, it really matters and I, I thank you very much for bringing this forward and hopefully we can we can close this loophole of these shadow um, non-compete agreements. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Senator Mann. Is there anything that you'd like to say before we move to um, passage on to judiciary? I believe, Madam Chair, uh, I just you know if we believe in a free market, then we should let people work where they want for who they want, and that's uh, what this bill aims to do. Thank you, Senator Mann. Okay, um, just one moment. Okay, here just a second. Um, just for the record, um, I just want to note that we had a, uh, people sort of um, come in in a, in a staggered way, but I want to note for the record that a quorum is present and that there was a, a quorum present at the time that we adopted the A1 amendment. So the first vote we took, we did have quorum. So just for the record, making sure that that is buttoned up. Um, Members, would someone like to move that Senate file 3721 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee? So moved. Thank you very much, Senator. Um, on that motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. 
All right. Um, the motion passes. Thank you very much, Senator Mann. Next uh, up on our agenda today, we have Senate File 3890, which is a bill brought to us by Senator Seeberger. Welcome, Senator Seeberger. Good afternoon. And I understand, Senator Seeberger, you also you have an A1 amendment that you would like to address first. That's correct, Madam Chair. And I'm delighted to once again be presenting my first bill of the session before the Labor Committee. I'm here today with Bill uh, 3890, and I do have the author's amendment, the A1 amendment. Very good. Uh, would a member please move the A1 author's amendment? Thank you, Senator. Uh, Senator Grunhagen moves the, um, moves the A1 amendment. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The A1 amendment is adopted. Thank you. To your bill. Thank you. Um, this bill was crafted following extensive stakeholder engagement meetings and represents a step forward in ensuring access to apprenticeship opportunities in Minnesota. The aim of this bill is to promote the growth of registered apprenticeship beyond the traditional building and construction trades, ensuring that workers across various industries receive structured training that prepares them for success in today's competitive economy. This bill updates terminology, streamlines the administrative process, and align state laws with federal regulations. These changes are intended to remove barriers and facilitate the establishment of apprenticeship programs in industries such as healthcare, information technology, and education. By modernizing apprenticeship statutes, Minnesota seeks to foster a skilled workforce equipped with nationally recognized credentials, promoting economic growth and opportunity for workers statewide. And I have a couple of testifiers here that can tell you a little bit more about the bill and its uh, 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 need within the industry. Thank you very much, Senator Seeberger. Uh, first on the list of testifiers, uh, we have listed Aaron Larson. Good afternoon, welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. If you would please introduce yourself for the record, but, and then uh, we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Chair McEwen and members of the committee. My name is Erin Larson, and I am the Apprenticeship Director at the Minnesota Department of Labor and Industry. I'm here today to speak in support of Senate File 3890, the Department's Apprenticeship Policy Bill. The bill is a result of extensive engagement with stakeholders, including the Apprenticeship Advisory Board, and would update Minnesota's apprenticeship statutes to, and allow for broader participation in registered programs. Additionally, this legislation would better align Minnesota's apprenticeship program with federal apprenticeship requirements. Specifically, some of the changes within the proposal include the use of terms besides journey worker that may be used in industries outside of the building and construction trades. For example, registered apprenticeship programs in childcare and education often refer to journey workers as mentors. This updated language in section three is directly from the federal apprenticeship regulations and would not impact any journey worker requirements outlined in other statutes for licensed trades. Additionally, uh, the proposal includes a less restrictive ratio requirement for the supervision of apprenticeships, excuse me, apprentices in programs outside of the building and construction trades or other hazardous occupations. The proposal includes an extended and prorated probationary period for apprentices and additional clarification around the apprenticeship program deregistration process. Other changes align the protected classes to state and federal laws or are purely technical in nature, such as deleting outdated references or correcting terminology. For example, um, using career and technical education rather than vocational. The less restrictive ratio requirements in section 11 of the bill would only apply to those programs outside of the building and construction trades or other hazardous occupations. The ratio requirements for apprenticeship supervision in the building and construction trades or other hazardous excuse me, occupations would remain unchanged where the ratio absent of a collective bargaining agreement is one apprentice to one journey worker for the first apprentice and then one apprentice to three journey workers thereafter. 
Prospective sponsors from outside of the building and construction trades have indicated that the current one-to-one, one-to-three ratio is not reasonable for programs and industries such as information technology, healthcare, or education, and has prevented some employers from registering a program. For example, many information technology companies would not have seven journey workers on staff to supervise three apprentices within a development program. Additionally, these apprentices would not encounter the same types of safety hazards found on a construction site. The proposed change to the probationary period in section 13 of the bill extends the probationary period for an apprentice from 500 hours to one, one year or 25% of the length of the program, whichever is shorter. This proposed change matches the federal regulations um, for the probationary period of apprentices, and it was a recommended change from existing registered apprenticeship programs. The proposed changes to the deregistration process in sections 19 to 23 of the bill align the process to other state and federal requirements. The, appren the apprenticeship division at DLI works closely with programs to provide technical assistance. There are rare occasions when programs must be deregistered, and the proposed changes provide clarity to that process for both DLI and registered apprenticeship programs. In summary, we believe these changes are reasonable and necessary to continue to grow registered apprenticeship in Minnesota. We appreciate your consideration of Senate File 3890, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Director Larson. Next on our uh, testifiers list, we have Tom Ticklich. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee, uh, Mr. Ticklich. If you'd please. Uh, Introduce yourself uh, formally for the record, and we look forward to your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Tom Dicklich, and I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Building and Construction Trades Council, which represents over 70,000 members across the state of Minnesota. On behalf of our members, I'm here to speak in favor of Senator Seberger's Senate File 3890, the Apprenticeship Program Policy and Technical Modification Bill put forward by the Department. We thank, this, we thank Senator Seberger for carrying this legislation, and we thank the Department for the thought and the input they took while putting this bill together. Having worked with the Department, we see daily the importance and seriousness the Apprenticeship Minnesota has when it comes to overseeing this program. There are over 11,000 apprentices in the state, and roughly 90% of these are in the building and construction trades. With the amount of building and construction going on around the state of Minnesota, these apprenticeship programs ensure the women and men working in the field and on these sites have the proper skills and training to do these jobs safely and at a high level. The building trades unions that I represent are the only organization in the state that represent approximately 10,000 apprentices. From that perspective, I want to talk about apprentice, apprentice ratios for a minute. While we do not object to the provision in the bill that allows other industries that aren't as safety sensitive as construction to allow a higher proportion of apprentices on a job site, we appreciate the proposal, the proposal does not allow construction programs to lower this ratio. The apprenticeship ratios in construction are critical for two reasons. One is to ensure a limited number of workers on a site who have little or no experience. That is critical for the safety of apprentices and everyone on the site. The second is because the purpose of the apprenticeship program is to allow for a supervised on-the-job training by a skilled professional. Apprentices are not on the job site to provide cheap labor. They're there to learn the trade and have a meaningful experience. We know that some non-union companies have voiced an interest in starting an apprenticeship program with lower ratios, but from our perspective, representing actual apprentices and journey-level workers in the industry, that would be a mistake. It would lead to less safe work sites and treat apprentices simply as less skilled, cheap labor. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Next on our list of testifiers, we have John Beshi. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Senate Labor Committee. If you would please formally introduce yourself, and yeah. I look forward to hearing from you. Uh, thank you, Chair McEwen, members of the committee. For the record, my name is John Beshi. I'm with the Associated Builders and Contractors of Minnesota. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comment on Senate File 3890. Uh, again, for the record, ABC is a trade association that consists of over 350 members serving the commercial and industrial construction industry and their 22,000 plus workers. These men and women are part of the 75% of the workers in the Minnesota construction industry that choose to be merit shop craft professionals. Uh, at ABC, we advocate for an all-of-the-above workforce development strategy that includes industry-driven and government-registered apprenticeship programs so that workers and employers have the freedom to choose the best way to provide value. Uh, we are supportive of efforts to make registered apprenticeship more accessible and inclusive and want to thank the department for being a valued partner and resource as it relates to ABC's registered apprenticeship program. I also want to thank Senator Seberger for meeting with me this morning to talk through some aspects of the bill. 
So we participated in the stakeholder listening sessions that were held last fall and submitted comments regarding ways to make registered apprenticeship more accessible to our members. And like I said, we're not opposed to the underlying bill, but we are disappointed that this bill does not contain one of our key recommendations regarding the modification of ratios for construction apprentices. When we talk to our members about registered apprenticeship, this is one of the biggest barriers to participation. While the bill strikes the three to one journey worker to apprenticeship ratio for other industries, it maintains this restrictive requirement for building and construction trades, uh, particularly for employers who do not have collective bargaining agreements. We believe that if a one to one ratio is deemed to be safe for the first apprentice, it should also be considered safe for each additional apprentice. These are also the ratios permitted in federal apprenticeship states and we've seen it done safely. For example, in North Dakota, which is a federal apprenticeship state, they allow for a one to one ratio and we have members who participate in registered apprenticeship and perform work in North Dakota and have historically performed high quality work in a safe manner utilizing this ratio. Uh, in Minnesota, we have many contractors who currently operate outside of the registered apprenticeship program. Um, you know, they, they have apprentices just not registered with, with the state, and so they're not subject to these ratios. And many of these contractors have not had any recordable incidents in over tens of thousands of work hours in a year. Maintaining that three to one ratio for each additional apprentice makes it counterproductive for a merit shop contractor to participate in a registered apprenticeship program in Minnesota because having to hire in place three journey workers just to bring on one additional apprentice is it's inefficient and it inhibits job creation. Uh, we recently had a local Minnesota contractor that was interested in looking into setting up a program with the goal of registering anywhere from 50 to 100 apprentices in the first year alone. And unfortunately, these ratios created a disincentive to participate because the need to hire additional journey workers made the program unworkable and unaffordable, uh, especially competing in the, in the national market. Um, if the registered apprenticeship model is to be considered the gold standard of training, the state should be finding ways to encourage voluntary participation in these programs, not maintaining barriers that make it more difficult for the vast majority of the construction industry to participate. You know, to be honest, even an ongoing ratio of one to two would be an improvement as far as we, we are concerned. Um, you know, in conclusion, while we appreciate the idea of removing roadblocks to program expansion and creating more opportunities for apprentices, we think that more can be done to address the true barriers to participation for 75% of the state's construction workers. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide comments. As this bill moves forward, we hope that you will consider our recommendations and modify the bill to develop a structure that is truly inclusive and applies fairly across the board. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, before we move on to member discussion, I just, those are, that completes our, the list of people who signed up to offer testimony. Would anybody else um, who has joined us today like to offer some testimony to the committee in regard to Senate file 3890? Sir, you can welcome. Please join us at the testifier's desk if you would. Make sure, um, sir, that you sign in to our, there's a little list there where you can sign your name and um, if you would sign into there before, uh, after you're done so that we have a record of, of your participation, that would be appreciated. If you would please introduce yourself um, and then um, we're trying to just keep, in order to keep things moving along, we'd like to keep the testimony to two minutes, um, but I'll, we'll give a little leeway around that too because I know that um, some of our testifiers have gone a little longer than that. So. Um, Welcome, sir. Uh, if you'd introduce yourself, we look forward to your testimony. Uh, yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, sir, I'm sorry, could you move in a little bit? We can't hear very well. It's a, sort of a weird thing. Um, thank you. Thank you, uh, Chair and members on the Labor Industry uh, Senate com Committee. My name is Rick Heller. I unofficially represent the twice exceptional and people with print disabilities. Last year, the governor struck the word handicap and put the word print disability in there. 2013, they put the jog and the lingo word in the statute, twice exceptional, in the gifted education program, the statute 120B15. I come to testify today on this uh, 3890. I, I, one thing when I picked up the document, I, I always look for the word disability because really it's more about ability, but frankly how people access content. 
you really want to get serious with organizations that are involved in labor, that they follow what the legislature is going to apply in October 2024, which is web content accessibility guidelines and, and or 508. Those who use federal funds obviously have to do that. Um, also, it's my understanding that kids that enter into apprenticeship programs have to have a GED, and that's a barrier. Um, if they're working on a GED or you know, yet to acquire a diploma, uh, those are barriers. You need to consider this uh, as far as um, the, uh, the la other language in this bill, if I understand it. Uh, they're, they're redefining what a journeyman worker is. I believe approximately four years ago, I think the uh, Department of Labor and Industry set standards on that ratio. If I understand it correctly today, they say they're striking that language uh, about that ratio that they have established uh, about three years ago. Is that correct? Uh, would would uh, anybody be able to speak for that so I can continue, or should I just skip to the next thing? Sir, why don't you uh, go ahead and, and continue on with your testimony, and we'll make note of going back to the issue of the ratio so that we can make sure that it's, it's clear. Uh, okay, so I can assure you that unless the Department of Labor Industry monitors these ratios, if they do exist, uh, ratios uh, specifically for certain trades, they're not monitored, and unless they monitor and force frankly, and striking something to do with that. I'm not quite sure what it's all about. Uh, there's one thing to put the things in law. However, if you're not monitoring it, then, then what do you got? So I, I think you all need to consider the, these items I expressed. Uh, if uh, college universities, uh, this is not a college university, the apprenticeship programs. They're, they're, they're kids that can it's my understanding if school districts allow it that from age, uh, or not necessarily age, but grade from 11, 12 graders do not have to have any more full seat time in the school districts and can go to their place of employment and work full time and the dollars follow those students so they can still graduate in time with their peers. So when we think about the barriers, uh, and labor law requires certain age, okay? But you can strategically place kids that don't fall under labor law regarding being over age 18 on a project. And you need to really think ahead when you plan these things that have that discussion. And all, one last thing I think you need to know, the apprenticeship programs are required to have affirmative action program in place. They are not clearly posting them online for the public. No, you have to go fishing at the Department of Labor and Industry to get these documents. Are they making this stuff fully accessible? It's something to think about for uh, twice exceptional students, whoever they are. And when the word handicap got struck, the uh, word print disability. Who are these individuals and their opportunity for employment? Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. I, I, I hope other people support Senate File 2694. It kind of gets at the this year, it gets kind of at the beginning of defining uh, some lingual and jargon words in the statute. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. Thank you very much, sir, for your testimony. Okay. Um, before we move to um, discussion of the bill before us, Senator Seberger, would you like to say any sort of closing words for the initial presentation of the bill? Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I would point out that this bill is supported by the Union Building Trades, 49ers, and there have been no other uh, objections from any of the other trades. Um, so I commend the stakeholders for working hard on this bill, and I'm, I'm pleased to be here with you today to support it. Thank you, Senator Seberger. Members, any questions or comments? Yes, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, I do have an A2 amendment. Okay. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Uh, we are going to pass out the A2 amendment. While that is being passed out, would you like to talk uh, and tell us about your amendment, Senator? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, the um, and I guess what it does, it uh, responds to Mr. Beshi's uh, uh, comments about not being included. And I guess before I take any additional uh, comments. I'd like to hear your rationale for not allowing it to be uh, 
apply to the uh, building and construction trades that Mr. Beshi re referenced? Madam Chair, if, she, if Thank uh, you. Senator Seeberger would like to respond. Thank you, Senator Grunhagen. Senator Seeberger. Thank you. Um, and I would uh, invite Ms. Larson to address those concerns if she's able. Thank you for joining us back at the table, Director, um, to the Senator's question. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the question, Senator. Um, so at the Department of Labor, apprenticeship safety is our priority, and with the current uh, statute 178, that's, that uh, setup with the ratios of one to one, one to three is intended to support that. Um, programs that have, have pursued other ratios through that collective bargaining agreement have prepped have typically done that over the course of the life of their, their program and have gotten input from their apprentices and journey workers about the safety of that. And so we believe that that one-to-one, one-to-three really does support that, that safety of, of the apprentice first and foremost. Uh, Follow-up, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, thanks for that response. The thing is, uh, you know, uh, based on Mr. Tes Mr. Beshi's testimony, other states uh, don't seem to have a problem with that ratio, and there's also a well-documented track of safety, according to his testimony. Do you have data that contradicts his testimony in terms of the safety? You said it's about safety, but is there statistics that show that that actually is safety, or is it just uh, for some other reason? Uh, director or Senator, um, whoever wishes to field that question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. So um, each state is able to, uh, if it's a state apprenticeship agency, which Minnesota is, is able to set that, that requirement around ratio. So each state, as you described, does have that different set. So it will vary across the country from state to state. Um, apprenticeship research around those different pieces is not a, a well-researched field, field, but um, we can certainly double check too to just do a research poll and, and provide that information for you too. Follow-up, Senator? Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you for that response. And uh, I guess, uh, you know, with the lack of data, in ter you, we use the word safety, but yet with the lack of data to support the idea that it's really about safety, we did hear the testimony that it is in uh, making it difficult for hiring with that type of ratio for these uh, contractors. And, uh, and I just think that uh, we should make things as level as possible for the private sector in construction. And, you know, what my amendment would do is actually on uh, line 4.19 on page 14. You on know, page 4. In the bill, I think I think you had said page fourteen, but it's page oh, four. Four point no line four point nineteen. Did I say that correct? Incorrectly? Okay, I'm open to correction. Remember that. <laughs> I've been married for forty eight years, so, <laughs> um, and I just think that I would encourage uh, the author, and you know, to take a look at the data, and if there isn't. If we have other states uh, allowing that ratio in these areas, and there isn't data to, to uh, substantiate the safety issue, you are making it difficult for these uh, private sector uh, building and construction trades to hire additional people. And I think that's what we want. And uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, withdraw the amendment. I'm not gonna force a vote. But I would just strongly encourage you to uh, look at that point and try to make it as, as level as possible. And I think it would be a benefit uh, uh, to employers in, in uh, these areas and also in compliance with what other states offer versus what we have here. I do like the bill. I do appreciate it that it's going in that direction. But I don't think it goes quite far enough in terms of creating a level playing field. With that, I'll draw, withdraw the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair. Thank you, Thank you Senator, um, for the discussion. And uh, the A2 amendment is withdrawn. Uh, members, any further questions or comments? Yes, Senator Kubek. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I do know um, 
one data point that we do have on this is the our neighbor to the west, North Dakota, uh, does have the highest death rate per capita of workers in the country. So that is one data point we do have. Thank you, Senator. Members, any further questions or discussions on Senate file? Um, yes, 3890. Yes, Senator Gerdhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, Senator Kubek, do you know what areas that is in? Is it in the construction and the building trades? No, it's just across the state, but in general, uh, oh. the, the regulations are far less over there. And it's, you know, is it a direct correlation? I don't know, but it is a, it is a data point we do have. Thank you, Senator Kubek, and, and thank you for the discussion and, and, uh, and question, Senator Grunhagen. Yes, Senator Riesenberg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm, I'm guessing it would probably be in oil, uh, that, so not the construct, construction trades. Um, probably can't imagine by look at me, looking at me, I've done some construction myself, and people are going to want to do the best they can to stay safe. Um, I just think this puts a burden on these people. Um, I, I think that your amendment would have been a good amendment to have. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator Wiesenberg. Uh, members, any further questions about Senate File 3890 or discussion? Okay, um, Senator Seeberger, is there uh, any uh, final um, statement you'd like to make before we take our, our vote? And this bill also is going to judiciary and public safety after this. Uh, I have nothing further for the committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Seeberger, for the bill. Um, members, would someone like to move that Senate File 3890, as amended, be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee? Thank you very much. On Senator House Child's motion, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. The motion passes. Thank you very much, Senator Seeberger. And thank you, testifiers, also. Next on our agenda today, we have Senate File 3496, which is a bill brought to us by Senator May Quaid. Welcome, Senator May Quaid, to the Senate Labor Committee. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's great to be here. Um, and um, Senator, would you, uh, before you begin discussion about your bill and pre presenting it to us, would you like us to um, address the A2 Authors Amendment yes, please. before us? Please. Um, okay. Would a member uh, please move the A2 Authors Amendment? Thank you, Senator Pappas moves the A2 uh, Authors Amendment, the adoption of the A2 Amendment. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The A2 Amendment is adopted. Senator Mayquay, to your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I have um, copies of what the bill would look like now with the amendment, but all together, just so that it's not confusing. If folks want it, they can absolutely have one. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Um, thank you after you, Senator Mayquay. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, thank you for agreeing to hear Senate File 3496, which would ensure compensation for minors who are featured in content creation, among other important provisions. Currently, there's only one state in the country, Illinois, that has successfully passed legislation to legally protect the earnings of children who are featured in content creation, and I hope Minnesota can be number two. Senate File 3496 does four things. One, it defines what it means to be a minor engaged in the work of content creation by defining the percentage of time a minor spends being featured in content that is um, generating compensation or paid created by an adult. It requires content creators to create and retain records of the content that features minors until the child reaches the age of 21. It requires the creation and maintenance of a trust fund accessible only after the child reaches the age of 18 and contains the accrued compensation of the child featured in content creation. And it allows individuals featured in content creation to take civil action for damages and enforcement of record retention section so it, um, they can request that online platforms permanently delete content that creates minors who uh, revoke their consent. The provisions in this bill are becoming increasingly important as the landscape of content creation and influencers continue to evolve and expand. While it's not perfect, there are currently laws in place to protect children in various industries, including acting and modeling for commercials or movies or television shows. However, this new and exploding industry, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, has no guardrails to ensure that minors are properly protected and more importantly, compensated. 
Regardless of age, people deserve to be properly compensated for their work, and children deserve a chance to consent to how their image is kept online. I hope you will enjoy me in supporting this bill, and I am open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator May Quaid. Um, Senator May Quaid, we don't have anybody who has signed up to testify. Uh, yeah. That's on the correct. bill, um, but I am just uh, wanting to open it up here if there is anyone who has joined us today who would like to speak to Senate File 3496. Now is the time. Uh, I'm not seeing anyone stand or raise their hand. Uh, so with that, I will turn to member discussion of this very interesting and timely bill. Members, uh, any questions or discussion um, about Senate File 3496? Yes, Senator Grunhagen. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not against the idea per se, okay, because I think that can happen to children too. Are there any states around us or that you're aware of that have something similar to this that they're utilizing? Senator May Quaid. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Grunhagen. Um, yes, Illinois currently has this law in place, and then at least six other states, so Maryland, California, Georgia, Missouri, Ohio, and Arizona um, have introduced legislation. Um, Washington also has a bill. So it's a little bit different in each state, but we're recognizing more and more that minors are being featured in content creation that is generating compensation, um, and there are no rules that require that money to then go to the children. Okay. Senator, a follow-up. Yeah, the, the, um, thank you for that response. The, the only thing I think, it does seem a little complicated, and uh, I just, is there, you know, is it patterned after these other states, what they're doing? Uh, and I mean, there's just a lot of uh, hoops to jump through here, and I just think it, uh, I don't know how you enforce it, actually, too easily, but... Uh, if you care to respond, if we can simplify it somehow. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Senator Gruenhagen. Um, I think one thing to note, and I'll just kind of lay this out for folks on the committee, is that um, this only applies to content that generates compensation. So, you know, I have a daughter. We don't put her on the internet, but if I made a video and she did something really cute, which she does all the time, and it happened to get a lot of views and I ended up, you know, making $200 off of it, that wouldn't apply to this. This is for um, people who are generating compensation um, and that more than 30% of their content features their children. So it's not just they may appear in the background or their head is there. There's a chef, for example, on TikTok that I follow who often will cook for their children. So you see the back of their head, but the the featuring is the, the food that he's making. That wouldn't count towards this. This is, um, if you think of YouTube channels that have a lot of uh, family accounts, so, you know, the family is going to Disney World and there's, you know, a whole 30-minute video about their trip to Disney World. Contained within that 30-minute video is hours of schedules and filming and reacting and it's, it's work. And so if parents or adults are generating and earning compensation, not just from the content, but from paid sponsorship and ads and merch, um, the children or the minors then should be receiving compensation because it's often their labor that is producing the money. Um, so that is, that's kind of how it works. So it's not complex in the fact that people who reach this threshold um, are already earning uh, money from this and are already um, having to set up sponsorship deals and ads and you know different kinds of accounts on these online platforms. This wouldn't apply to just a, a random you know person who makes $100 one time on a video or shows their kid online one time or 10 times. Um, it's, a, it's a different kind of creator we're talking about here. Thank you, Senator. Follow-up, Senator Grunhagen. Yeah, just real quick. Thanks for that response, uh, Senator Mayquay. Say, so therefore, I did a video on my campaign website with my granddaughters, and if I get donations on the website, I don't have to uh, split that with them, in other words. Okay. <laughs> but you might want to pay them for their time. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you. Senator Pappas. Yeah, um, Madam Chair, and thank you for bringing this forward, Senator McQuaid. It's kind of interesting because when you think about child actors, for example, that was, I think, a, a model for what we need to do here mm -hmm. is that that's very hard work being a child actor. And so you have to kind of trust that the parent is looking out for them and not going out and, you know, buying sports cars and um, 
enriching themselves, you know, on the child's labor. And I just wondered if um, they can't access the trust funds until they're 18, and is there any other option? I mean, if there was a medical situation where the family needed money, maybe there was an accident or something that they didn't get compensated for by insurance, um, would there be an, an, a kind of an emergency option that could be included here? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Pappas, this is something we did talk about a lot, actually, when we were crafting this bill. Um, we talked a little bit about, you know, let's say you're a family-run account and you become very famous um, and you have to move or update security. The way that the account um, is, is divvied out is that it's the percentage of total gross earnings. So it's the, the amount of time they're spent featured in the content. So, um, you know, usually there, there are very few... I shouldn't say very few. It is not a predominant part of the market where it is just a minor who is featured in content that doesn't include the adult who's producing the content or making the content or, or other family members. And so um, there would be a percentage that goes in the trust related to the time the minor is, is um, featured in the content. Um, but I am really open to ways. I mean, once we start making exceptions, it's like, how many do we make? And so th that was the, the difficulty. So I do understand what you're saying. Um, and that's why we didn't do it is because I wasn't sure. I didn't want to start enumerating the instances and understanding, too, that part of it's going into a trust, but the other part of it is ideally going to the parent, the management team, the, the whoever that's behind the generated compensation. And Madam Chair yeah. and Sarah May Quaid, this is just in a situation where there are like sponsorships or ads. Like if, if a child or a mother or father would post a video of their child and then suddenly it goes viral, right? But there's no money involved, then it's not really applicable. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, there are videos that go viral that do generate compensation. Um, you know, it happens, you know, Corn Kid is, is an example that I can think of right now. Um, but the accounts themselves were like 15 people, right? It was just a funny video for 15 people that a bunch of people happened to find and see. That wouldn't apply here because this is, um, it is generated compensation, um, like over the course of time. So there has to be a, like 30% of the generated compensation content has to include the minor. So one video wouldn't count for 30% of anything. Um, so no, it wouldn't be that. It would be, yes, paid, paid sponsorships, yes, paid ads, um, but it would also, if somebody went viral and then they started earning compensation from their subsequent videos, then it would be just from those types of videos, which has happened. All right, Yeah. thank you. Thank you, Senator Pappas. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator McQuaid, for this. Uh, so just a couple questions. So you mentioned Illinois has had this. How long have they had it? And then just kind of some data about their, um, about their learning. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair, and Senator Dornick. Um, so Illinois passed their bill, and it was based on the testimony of a child who was, is the child of influencers who used their child pretty heavily in their content. Um, and so it was a very personal story. Um, the data is just, this is an $8 billion uh, industry. And so we know that it is highly lucrative. Um, we know that it is work, it is labor on the part of the, of the minors and, and the adults and the teams behind them. Um, and so I don't have like, I couldn't tell you how many, you know, minors in Minnesota this might affect, but I can tell you that this is an industry, um, it's one of the only industries where children work and aren't compensated for the money they generate from that work. Does that answer, I hope I answered your question. Follow up, Senator Dornick. Thank you, Madam Chair. So how long has the, the mm. law been in for, or, yeah, in force in uh, Illinois? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the law was passed last year. I don't know its effective date. My guess would be August, so a little less than a year. Senator Madam Dornick. Mm -hmm. So thank you. So thank you for that. So yeah, it's it's really new. So your is this bill modeled after Illinois? Then is that when I'm? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Dornick. It is modeled after Illinois, but it's better, um, and for a few reasons. Uh, one, uh, other bills in other states re often refer to this as a vlogging, like a family vlogging bill. Um, I've removed references to vlog because I feel like that could be outdated in just a few years. It's content creation, whatever that may be. 
Um, the second is in other states, they've uh, had the actual compensation for content be equal or greater to 10 cents a view. That is abnormally large amount of cents per view, which I don't even know if even the most famous content creators on the internet are making right now. So we changed it down to one cent per view, which is much more in line with what people are making. Um, other than that, I think, oh, the right to be forgotten. That is another piece too. And that you'll see um, at the end, uh, subdivision five, that starts on 4.11 if you're looking at the unofficial engrossment. Um, and it requires that content of a minor child uh, must be deleted by an online platform if it's requested. And this is a really important part. I think, you know, there's a lot of different kind of content um, online that includes children. Some of it is very personal, intimate moments um, that a child might not want to have on the internet, on TikTok, on YouTube, on Facebook, when they're 18 or 25 or you know, having their own children. An example I think of is um, there's a family YouTube channel that has many children. The oldest child has a different biological father than the rest of her siblings, and her biological father died. And they, f they filmed telling her that her biological father died. She's six or seven, I imagine she's probably not gonna want that on the internet in a few years. Probably by the time she's 13, certainly. Um, definitely by the time she's an adult. This would give her the ability to go to that online platform and say, please take that down. I do not consent to that video. Um, I think that is an incredibly important part of this video. You have run of the mill ones like children had a blowout in their diaper or they're going potty on the toilet for the first time. Really beautiful moments for anyone who has a child, usually not ones you wish are shared online forever for the public. And we're just kind of entering into that conversation. And so my goal and my hope is that we can set up really strong protections so that if in the future, young people who have aged would like content of them removed, it's able to be removed. That's a key difference between ours and Illinois. Thank you, Senator McQuaid. Senator Dornick, follow up. Thank you, up. Madam Chair. Uh, so one final question, I think. So I guess, did you talk to an agency or, you know, as far as the jurisdiction and the enforcement, how this is, you know, how do you navigate through, th for, through that? And so, yeah, I guess first one, if you had a conversation from which agency would be kind of watching over this and then the enforcement. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. The Department of Labor and Industry did provide some technical assistance to make sure that this is coded in the right part of statute. Um, this does provide a civil uh, course of action, so hopefully if this passes out of this committee, it would go to judiciary next, so there's you know, two different ways that there's enforcement. One thing I do wanna note is that um, much like if you have a child that goes into child acting, does commercials, movies, television shows, um, and you they, they advise you on how then to manage said money, right? There's something called a Coogan's account if you're, you know, a famous child actor after the uh, child actor Ryan Coogan, whose parents stole all of his money, um, and they tell you how to set that up, and they go through that process with you. Um, the goal here is to have the same sort of guidance be given to parents as they start generating this, whether it's from the online platforms themselves, whether it's from their banking institutions. Um, these trusts, you know, the framework for it already exists for other types of um, compensation that children earn from other kinds of industries. And so they would be getting this advice. It's very rarely just a, a person who just like makes a ton of money and it's just coming into their bank account with no other um, team of people that are involved in the production, the setting up, the, you know, merch. And there's, there's teams of people behind a lot of these family channels. Senator Dronick. Madam Chair, I guess uh, one more question. Yeah, after you. So just the, the lines between parental rights and kids, I mean, just that delicate, uh, you know, that we as government want to be careful that we don't um, overstep that line. And that's one of the concerns I have. But uh, if you can speak to that a little bit, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Dornick. I, I totally agree with you. And I think the, the line that we are walking here is replicating what already exists in other similar industries for an, a burgeoning industry that currently has no regulations. Um, you know, parents still would have the right to use their children in monetized content or content that generates compensation. It just would ensure that the labor that goes into it for the, from the minor's perspective is also compensated. I have certainly personal opinions about children on the internet, but that is not here in this bill. It is strictly about the compensation of minors in content that generates compensation because it's a you know, very important labor protection that exists almost everywhere else that children could earn money except this one. 
Follow-up, Senator Thank Dornick. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And yeah, just going through that, I'm just thinking, you know, obviously we don't want ch children abused. Nobody wants that. And uh, then again, just kind of going through that carefully. And just as we progress, it's pretty new legislation that uh, there might be some tweaks and adjustments uh, coming forward because we don't know what we don't know. Um, and I'd be curious to some of those other states. Uh, and you kind of gave me a couple uh, differences, which I appreciate that. So we'll. I mean, I'll be kind of watching it and uh, see how it goes through the process. So thank you. Thank you, Senator Dornick. Uh, Senator Housechild, did you have a question or comment? Thanks, uh, Madam Chair, and thanks, Senator McQuaid, for bringing this forward. Um, I, I'll, I'll admit that I'm fairly naive on this, despite being a millennial. Uh, <laughs> uh, so if, for instance, the corn kid, which I think is hilarious, uh, goes viral, and other folks start using it, I guess I'm not exactly sure how the compensation works as things go viral and, and explode in other areas. How would the child be paid for some of the, uh, sort of like outside their parents as things go viral? Does it capture those situations or? Senator McQuaid. Thank you, Madam Chair. That's a good question, Senator Housechild. Um, the way that some not, all uh, con generated compensation is you have to have the rights to the video. So if I reposted Corn Kid on my TikTok and it somehow like went viral, it's not my video and I don't have rights to it. So I actually can't earn compensation from it. Um, and so, so that would be one way. Um, but I do think that what you're raising is a question maybe about virality of, of videos. Like let's say I recorded a really interesting thing that two children were doing and put it out on the internet and started earning a lot of money. The difference there is that those children would have to be in 30% of my content in order for this to mm -hmm. apply to them. And that's why we kind of set that threshold okay. is children are in various people's videos. It's are they frequently in? And mm -hmm. we kind of set that as a third of the content. Senator House yeah. any follow-up? Yeah, just one other follow-up. Um, I listened to your opening testimony, and I was kind of reading through mm -hmm. the bill, but I think you had mentioned eight, something at 18 years old and maybe something at 21 years old. Mm. And, and I'm just, could you walk through that piece again and what, what, what different parameters go into effect at those different ages, if, if at all? Senator McQuaid, do you recall? I, I think I, I do recall, but yeah, after you. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. There are a few different age... Uh, call outs in here. The age of 21 is the um, age at which the records must be kept until from the adult who produced or created the content. Um, so they will retain records of um, the uh, hours that they worked in it and the compensation that was recorded from it, and they'll retain those until they're 21. Um, the 18 part is, um, is that content creation under this bill is that it has to be created by somebody who's over the age of 18. So what this doesn't cover, for example, is if I was 15 and I had a makeup tutorial channel and I made 15-year-old videos of myself doing makeup and I started earning money from that, this doesn't cover that because an 18-year-old and above is not making my videos. I am. So that is... Those are some of the age differences. I know I added another layer, but those are the age kind of call-outs I would point you to. Senator Halschild. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, members, any other questions or comments for Senator May Quaid? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Senator May Quaid, this is a, an extremely interesting bill, uh, as we can tell from this discussion and all of the detail that goes into it. I think at first it does appear to be complex, but as we talk about it a little bit more, we see the necessity of having these definitions really set out, the parameters really clearly defined, and so uh, I applaud you and the advocates who are who are following this issue and seeing the need to fill this gap where... You know, as you said, in this burgeoning industry, these protections just aren't there where they are in other industries, and of course we see the necessity for them. And it, it, it does strike me that even though this is so new, this is happening really fast. It's already happening, and, and people are already definitely being affected by this. So thank you for bringing this to us today. Um, members, would someone like to move that Senate File 3496 as amended be recommended to pass and be re-referred to the Judiciary and Public Safety Committee? Thank you, Senator Kupek. On Senator Kupek's motion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed, say nay. 
All right, the motion passes. You're on your way to judiciary. Thank you very much, Senator McQuaid. And with that, the Senate Labor Committee is concluded and adjourned.